welcome today to Downsize Your Stuff to Right Size Your Life, uh, presented by Riverwoods and Dovetail Companies. My name is Sherry Young, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today to our presentation. Uh, before we get underway, we have just a couple of housekeeping notes to share with you. Um, because of the size of our group, everyone is on mute, but we welcome your questions. And we ask that you submit these through Q&A. Chat is, dis is disabled for the presentation today, but you can place your comments and questions directly in the Q&A box. And you needn't wait until the end of the presentation. If there's something that you want to ask as we're going through, you're certainly welcome to um, submit as we go along. We also welcome suggestions on um, how we could improve our presentations as well as ideas um, that you may have for a topic that you'd like us to cover in the future. Um, before we begin, I also just like to share a little bit about Riverwoods. Uh, we are, uh, you know, Riverwoods has been a leader in redefining retirement now for over 25 years. What started as a bold concept has grown into one of the most, most trusted living, uh, most trusted senior living organizations in New England. Uh, we were created by a grassroots group of residents. Um, Riverwoods is where active independent adults find community, purpose, peace of mind with excellent health care if and when you need it. You see a representation here of our three communities in southeastern New Hampshire, Riverwoods Exeter, Riverwoods Manchester, and Riverwoods Durham. For those of you who maybe are not familiar with the continuing care retirement community model, the CCRC, let me just give you a quick uh, overview. A, a CCRC is an insurance product. Contracts are regulated by the state um, uh, Department of Insurance in which you are located. So in our case, the New Hampshire uh, Department of Insurance. Our financial performance is reported to the state annually. We are a not-for-profit 501c3 organization. You are prepaying or insuring what your potential costs would be in assisted living, memory support, or nursing care. And a portion of the entrance fee that you pay when you join the community, as well as a, a portion of your uh, monthly service fee uh, while in independent living are also tax deductible. This is a lifestyle choice that you are making to remain independent and enjoy your highest quality of life. You do enter the community when you can enjoy independent living, um, to have that freedom from home, home maintenance chores, um, including housekeeping and, and dining. Um, this offers you a, a, a really worry-free um, lifestyle. Courtesy transportation is offered to you as a resident, as well as life engagement, uh, activities, programs, ongoing education, each community having its own uh, community life program, which is highly directed by the residents of the community. Um, this increases, and this is something that I think we've all recognized, especially over the last two years, the importance of increasing social engagement opportunities, having that opportunity to be with others, and, and most importantly, staying in control of your life and knowing that you have made a plan for your future. Speaking of control, uh, today we're gonna be talking about how to control all that stuff that may be running your life right now um, and you wanna be back in, in control. Um, our presenter is Joe Scott, the Director of Move Management from Dovetail Companies. He is a certified senior specialty move manager he understands that uh, each of us has a, you know, requires a special approach. We all have individual situations, and he understands the emotions and feelings that are connected with downsizing all of our things and transitioning to a new home. He has years of experience managing the various aspects of downsizing, both professionally and personally, which gives him a unique set of skills that has been a great resource to um, our residents in the Riverwoods communities. Um, Dovetail Companies provides one point of contact services um, for an older adult then can help them successfully plan and execute, execute uh, their transition from a long time home into a new uh, worry-free living environment. So 
without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Joe. And again, I want to remind you that you are welcome to enter your questions as we are going through and we will allow time at the conclusion of the event um, for your questions. And yes, we are recording this. And yes, you will receive a copy of this recording. So Joe, thank you for being here with us and uh, looking forward to hearing all of your advice. Thanks very much. And thanks to the Riverwood community. We're so thrilled to, to partner with you and making these transitions to your beautiful communities smooth for all of your residents. And thanks to all of you for joining. It's really amazing that we have folks from far and wide, very envious of those folks in Hawaii as we're expecting about a foot of snow tomorrow, uh, but it will be a good time to, to begin the right sizing exercise. So first of all, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the term downsizing versus right sizing. And I think downsizing can have a negative connotation and there are very prescribed methods as to how you go about doing something. And I think because we all have different needs in our lives, we all have different personalities, right sizing seems to fit for me because I think that it comes to what's right for you is not right for someone else. And we think that right sizing is really a process that feels right for you and creates a comfortable environment for you to live. I have an example of working with a client who we were downsizing in her kitchen and she had three ladles. There was one, uh, they were all about the same size. They all had about the same size bowl. There was one that was kind of ornate and the, the bowl was scalloped edge. And then she had another one that was very plain and another one that had a heavy uh, resin or wooden handle. And I asked her, I said, do you need three of these you know, ladles? They're, they're pretty much all the same size. And she said, well, the ornate one was uh, one that belonged to a compote bowl that her mom had. She didn't have that bowl anymore, but she still used that uh, ladle as part of her um, you know, um, dining experiences and how she'd serve relishes and salsas and stuff. And she also had a, 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 the second one, which was just belonged to a, um, a stainless steel gravy boat that she had. So she wanted to keep that one. And the third one that had the, the comfortable handle was one that she used when she did hot fudge Sunday bars with her kids and her grandkids. If we had taken the prescribed method of you need one ladle, that would not have been right for her. We also went further down the drawer and she had two wine openers and she said, I don't need any of those, I don't drink. But we made sure that she had one in case she had, she had guests who wanted to have a bottle of wine. It really is the time to talk now about downsizing. Um, the uh, great book called The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning, sounds far more ominous than it is, was written by a woman of, by the name of Margareta Magnusson. And she was 86 when she wrote it. And she identifies the art of Swedish death cleaning as the process of getting your home comfortable the closer we get to leaving this earth. And when I read that, I was thinking, boy, the time is now, because regardless of your age, whether you're 20, 60, 80, 90, every day you live, you're closer to uh, the, the, the last day on earth. So I really read that as the time is now, it's never too early uh, it really uh, to start the process. Starting the process can be daunting. I mean, it is a very daunting emotional uh, process for lots of people. Uh, because all of the things that we have came from different places and different periods in our lives. And we'll talk about where everything came from, why it's still in our house. Why did we hold on to it? Why is it still in the basement? And then how to get started. There are so many different opinions about starting the right sizing process, but we have one that we wanna share with you, hoping that now is the time you begin your right sizing. We hope that our approach is helpful to you. First of all, the best news that you could probably hear, we've lived. So it all came from incredible life experiences. We all have stuff. And I think that sometimes, you know, it's not misery loves company, but the, the collector loves company. Um, and it came from the fact that we had monumental life events. We got married, we had children, we had birthdays, we worked, we were recognized, we have awards, we wrote papers, we had presentations from when we worked. And we have all of that stuff. We still do. Um, we've stayed current. You know, I've I've stayed current. I've been in my home for 20 years. I think we've painted our primary bath three times. I have three cans of paint in the basement that I'm going to use for touch-up that I've never used. 
um, but I stay current and I, you know, then have the remnants of staying current. Bought new pillows for the sofa. I took the old pillows and put them in, um, you know, put them in a, a, a guest room closet because they still were good and I'll save them someday. My mom used to always say, I'm going to save that for when we have a camp. She, I was, I'm one of eight children. We were never uh, going to have a camp. Um, but anyway, she saved a lot of things. And I think as we uh, remain current in our lives, um, we buy new clothes, we um, buy the latest and greatest of gadgets. It's fine. We should. But what we should be doing is moving one in, putting one in and moving one out. And we'll talk about that in how to maintain sort of the right sizing um, uh, status. The mailbox. Um, not only do we get a ton of junk mail, um, we hold on to it. We get all kinds of magazines that are that are unsolicited, full of advertisements and maybe one or two little stories we want to read. We dog air it and we save it. Um, we get you know blue envelope of value coupons. We save those, put them in a junk drawer, and then you know we we find that they expired in 2017. Greeting cards. I think. Uh, I was talking to my sister about greeting cards and she said, I can't throw them away. They're like five dollars each. Someone spent five dollars on this greeting card. I can't bear to throw it away. And it's absolutely right. So we end up keeping it. We end up keeping uh, everything that that some a lot of things that have come from our mailbox, our bills. You know, can we take a look at perhaps getting bills uh, online versus having to get a paper bill? But if you get a paper bill, get rid of the envelope, keep the bill you know, itself. And once it's paid, um, you know, destroy it by shredding it. We have had hobbies and our interests in different things has changed over the years. We could be an amazing uh, stained glass artist and we, we continue to do that. That's terrific. We have all the supplies, we have the equipment. We may have been at one time a great wood carver, but stopped doing wood carving. We still have blocks of, you know, uh, burled maple and we still have lathes and chisels and all of these things. We don't use it anymore, but uh, we still have it you know, in our homes. How do you deal with the beautiful creations, right? That, that, that you came up with um, that you still have in your house. You either sell them on a, a site like Etsy uh, or you give them away as gifts. And then you have all of the equipment that you used to, um, uh, to, to produce them. You can also, you know, always donate that to senior centers or, you know, sometimes to schools, after school programs, those kinds of things. And our interests and hobbies uh, will continue. We're going to continue to live, right? And it, the right sizing process doesn't mean that you don't have monumental life events still happening. It doesn't mean that you don't stay current. And it doesn't mean that you pick up an, a, a new hobby that you may be interested in for, you know, a month or, or a year. And we'll talk about how you can continue to do that. The store, I think, you know, Costco, BJ's, Sam's Club, I think that they are the sort of the, the best and worst things that ever happened to a lot of us. And we end up getting probably more things than we need. Um, it's very appealing to go in and see the latest small appliance. We have a toaster at home on the counter, but we see a, an air fryer combination toaster at Costco, we pick it up, we just move the toaster over, or we move the toaster to the basement. Uh, instead of sort of dealing with that, we buy paper towels and toilet paper, continue to buy as much as, as, as they, can, they can offer us. I had a client that used to buy the, as a client, husband and wife lived, they lived by themselves and they had uh, huge boxes of cereal. And I said, now, what do you do with all these? They were in the basement in one of those Rubbermaid um, portable closets. And she, well, I buy, buy all of that at Sam's. And I said, well, well, then why is it down here? She says, well, it doesn't fit in my cabinet. So she puts it on plastic containers. We took a look through and she had some of the cereal that had been expired. She had had it there you know, for so long, I could never get through it. And I said, why don't you just get smaller boxes? You're, you're throwing it away. And then if you buy all that, you're eating all brand for months, if not years. So um, we're all tempted to do it because we think it's a really good deal when ultimately it really, is not, and you probably can afford yourself a little bit more variety if you if you don't buy you know in bulk because you are stuck using uh, whatever that is. And at all, they also come. All of our stuff comes from other people's right sizing efforts. Our parents, our grandparents, our aunts, our uncles, our friends. They all either gave us things that we wanted and were interested in getting, or they assumed we wanted something and gave it to us, or just by virtue of. Uh, being a, 
a son or a daughter or a cousin or a nephew, whatever that is, we just ended up with it. We just inherited it and don't know sort of how to get rid of it. So now we know where it all came from. Why do we still have it in our homes? And I think one, you know, out of sight, out of mind, we can put it in the basement and know that it's in the basement and think someday I'm going to deal with that. Or we put it in the basement and totally forget about it. Or we put it in the attic, we totally forget about it because those are the rooms that are less traveled. The day that you sort of remember, oh, I should go down and take a look at what's in the basement. You open that door and you have so much and it's so overwhelming. And some of those things that are in there can absolutely you know, represent something. And if it's emotional and it has sentimental value, it's gonna be really difficult for you to deal with that. And it's a very common thing. What is very emotional and sentimental to me is gonna be very different from, for each one of you. Um, so we'll talk about how you can deal with some of the emotion that comes with uh, dealing with uh, items that you still may have in your house. You're saving it for someone. You're saving it for your son, your daughter, your grandson, your niece, your cousin, your friend, assuming that they want it. Um, I think that the, the best option is to ask right now. I'm saving this lamp for you because you said you liked it. Uh, you said you liked it 15 years ago when it was in style. Um, ask the question, do, do you want this? Or as you go through this process, ask people in your life, you could almost have an open house, um, ask people in your lives, this is what I have, what are you interested in? You can take anything. And then there's another thing we can do is ask people, just decide, you know, the people that you have very close relationships with, your kids, your grandkids, your cousins, your best friends, ask them, is there something in my house that really means a lot to you? Aaron uh, DiCarlo, the president of Dovetail, tells a really great story about um, when her grandma, uh, grandmother passed, she was in college, she went back after services and um, came back to her grandmother's house and her dad and her aunt were cleaning the house out. And um, she, all she wanted were some plastic bracelets that her grandmother used to wear. And her dad and her aunt thought that they had absolutely no value. So they threw them away, kind of like the first things to go. And Erin was really upset by that. And she said, those bracelets, the clanking of those bracelets as my grandmother you know, brushed my hair really brought such comfort to me. So if her grandmother had said, what is it that you want? What is it that's important to you in my life? Or her dad or her aunt had said that, she would have had those things instead of assuming um, that they, they, um, you know, they aren't worth, you know, they aren't worth anything. And then finally, we have absolutely no idea why we have all of what we have. And sometimes it's just because it's there. So let's talk a little bit now about how you can get started with the process. At Dovetail, we say that you need to take everything in very manageable bites. You can't boil the ocean. You have to take it step by step because if you try to do it all at once, you're gonna get overwhelmed. Everyone is gonna get overwhelmed regardless of, um, you know, regardless of your age or your situation or how much stuff you have. So take it in manageable bites, but take it with consideration for what we call the emotional and functional scale. So the emotional and functional scale says that anything that is low emotion, low sentimental value, that's where I start. And I have to also have consideration for my current home and my lifestyle. I may be moving in two years, one year, six months, whatever that is, I have to make sure that I'm keeping what it is that I need now to maintain my lifestyle. And don't worry about that dining room set that you proudly entertain, you know, neighbors and friends and family in your dining room right now that has, you know, eight chairs and two leaves to the table and a china cabinet and a sideboard. You may not need that when you move to Riverwoods, but you need it now. Don't deal with it now and don't get rid of it now. It's a very simple example, but I think it's really important as you go through the process to recognize there's an end game. If your end game is just to have a right-sized home, then you're gonna keep those things that are important to you. But also you have to remember during the process that you're going to continue to live, that you're gonna to continue to have those monumental events and stay current. 
And then your timeline, and your timeline is just that. I suggest here you do it on a quarterly basis. Um, if you're moving in a year, that's a great way to sort of approach it. If you're moving in a month, you know, maybe you break it up in weeks or days. Um, so really it's the timeline that you're comfortable with that allows you to get there. It can be accelerated, but I think regardless of what the time is, whether it's a long period of time or short period of time to the end, I think you have to take it in manageable bites and you have to start with those things that don't have much emotion attached to them. So let's take a look at an example. These are examples of items that I think um, to me have sort of lower emotional value and get up to sort of what's higher in emotional value for me. Um, paint cans, those three paint cans that I have from painting my bathroom, they're still in the basement. I don't have any emotional attachment to them. And if I did, they probably there probably would be an issue. So I deal with those paint cans. I put some crud cutter in them or some kitty litter, let them dry out and put them in the trash. I deal with paint thinners. I deal with my junk drawer. You know, we all have the junk drawer to shut the drawer. You have to push down all the takeout menus and, you know, and, and shut the drawer. Deal with that junk drawer on a periodic basis. Um, but you'll finally, you'll get incredible satisfaction knowing that you've taken that very small step. The kitchen pantry spices, what's outdated, what food items are outdated, you know, discard those and recycle the containers, items, food items that you bought, maybe some of that stuff that you got at uh, Costco or Sam's or BJ's, and it's not expired, look to, you know, to donate some of that. Um, pots and pans, and I think this is a good example of um, why we say take it item by item as opposed to room by room. So if I look at pots and pans in my house, they are in my mudroom closet, my basement, and my kitchen. If I'm going to right size my inventory of pots and pans, I don't do it just with what's in the kitchen. I gather it all and make a determination about how many saute pans I need. Do I need that lobster, you know, lobster pot if I'm moving, you know, to, to, uh, to Riverwoods where they're going to have clam bakes for me? all of those things. So deal with the entire inventory at once. And those items that you don't need, you're right-sizing them. Those are the items that can get donated. And we'll talk about giving things a new life. The thing that's important, I think about um, taking it item by item as opposed to room by room, is that by taking those pots and pans from the kitchen, from the basement and from the mud rooms uh, closet, I've chipped away at the basement, the kitchen and the mud room. If I had gone down to the basement and just tried to start the process of downsizing the basement, right-sizing it, I would not know sort of where to even begin. And then you say, oh, this pot, this, this pot, this, you know, these pots and pans are something uh, I guess I need. But if you don't have it and look at it as the total inventory of everything that you own, you'll end up probably holding on to more than you need. But the biggest advantage of doing that is you chip away chip away at every, um, you know, at every uh, space as you, as you look at every item. There are absolutely ways that you can downsize um, a room and we have a right sizing guide that we can share with you and it gives you some suggestions. I say, if you're gonna do a room by room, room, by room downsizing, really please do it um, in, in, in some of the smaller rooms. Duplicate tools, that's, you know, that's a great one. Some of us, I, I don't know how many screwdrivers I have, they're all the same size. Do I really need all of those, you know, all those screwdrivers? Clothing is a great one. And I think if you take the clothing for the current season, like right now looking at sweaters and flannel shirts, um, things that you're wearing right now, you probably could identify the ones that you wear on a regular basis. It's probably less easy, to recall things that you wore last summer. But so it's easier right now to say, what am I wearing in the middle of winter? What have I worn since the end of November? Really taking a look at those, you know, the, the, the clothing, but don't just take a look at the clothing that's in your master bedroom uh, closet. Take a look at the clothing that may be stored in guest room closets or, or uh, somewhere else. Um, seasonal decor is a huge one. I try to do this after every, um, you know, every holiday, right after Christmas, for example, I did pull aside a bunch of things that we didn't put out for Christmas. 
and probably hadn't put them out for the last couple of years. What are the things that I you know, put out for fall? Did I need, do I need all those wreaths that I have hanging in the basement? Probably, you know, probably not. Outdoor items, as you know, summer is approaching and we're thinking about getting things out on the patio. What statuary did I use? Did I put that planter on the patio? Did I use those rocking chairs? So start thinking about sort of those kinds of things because if you didn't use them or hadn't put them out, it's likely they don't have an emotional, you don't have an emotional attachment to them. And then getting rid of junk mail. And this is a cycle and you're gonna to wanna to get rid of junk mail um, because it has a lot of visual noise and it can make a space look more cluttered than it is, the things that we, that we save. I always go out of my garage to the mailbox because I wanna come back in through the garage because I wanna dump all my junk mail in the recycle bin. You can do the same thing um, by just immediately sorting your mail over your, over your recycling uh, trash can in your kitchen. As we move toward, you know, more towards the items that have more um, sort of value to me or things that I need to start thinking about even more, especially if I'm moving in a, in a year or nine months, bulk buying, I have to stop because I don't want a bunch of cereal that's gonna expire and I'm probably not gonna have any space for it. Magazines, do I really read all the magazines or do I get it because I like one writer that writes a very specific article every month about the same kind of thing and I like their style and I get that magazine just for them. Perhaps consider reading it, uh, you know, reading it online. Nightstand drawers, I call that the junk for the second floor. We all have stuff in our nightstand drawers that we probably don't even realize that that we have. We probably have some books in there, some eyeglasses, some hand cream. Um, guest room dressers, guest room closets. Again, going back, you probably hopefully have taken out, if you've dealt with clothing, you've probably taken care of all the clothing that's in the drawers and the closets of those guest rooms. But what else is in there? What else have you stashed away uh, in those um, closets? Again, I view those as individual items as opposed to tight you know, um, spaces. Um, because if you, again, if you're dealing with all your clothing, then what should remain in there is only clothing that you want, right? And then anything else that you're storing in there, whether it be games or, or anything like that. Work papers, um, I still have them. I, I spent 35 years in financial services and I have finally got rid of most of the presentations that I had done uh, or articles or, or papers that I had written um, I, I don't know why I was saving them. Um, there were a couple that I did scan and I saved and I recycled you know, all of the rest. Documents, it's tax time. So it's a really good time to ask your tax advisor or your accountant, what do I need to keep? And it's a good time for you now, if it is anything that's uh, greater than seven, you don't need anything greater than seven years, now is probably a good time to start dealing with that. Some people think, no, I need to have it for you know, whatever. But it's a good time now as you're doing taxes to confirm with your advisor, what is it that I absolutely need to keep? I can go through all of these items. One thing I wanna really address because it's, not, it's, a, it's important to me, but I, as I talk a lot about right sizing uh, in communities, books are huge. There are so many people who are avid book, avid book collectors, either you know, they have their favorite novels, they have coffee table books that have now become closet shelf books, um, they have reference books, atlases, bird watching books, how to books. They have all of these things. And I think books can be a very emotional thing to deal with because we, I know that I still do. I, you don't abuse a book. I remember growing, growing up, right, and being in school, books were something that were sacred. You had to cover them. And my mom used to cover them in brown paper. And you had to cover them and keep them and protect them because they were really an important source of you know, information. And I, I came very, you know, I came to, to very much respect, you know, to respect books. So take your first pass through your books. Don't take your first pass through your, you know, your favorite uh, novels, because inevitably you're going to go to that chapter that made you love that book so much. You're going to sit down, you're going to start reading it. Start with the books that really you don't really use. You know that you don't use very much. Start with your cookbooks. Start with those coffee table books that have now found a home in the closet, you know, start with atlases, all those kinds of things that um, really are not, are not useful to you. Encyclopedias, I can't tell you how many clients we have that have full sets of encyclopedias. There are markets for those and people will take them, 
uh, there are organizations that will take them. So let's get them, you know, let's get them donated. Um, there are also, uh, those items end up a lot in used bookstores. There's, I think a couple in, in New England where you can, you know, just donate them to a, a used bookstore. And stagers, we do some staging uh, as, a, as a move management company, stagers buy all kinds of books, especially um, uh, encyclopedias because they have really nice, you know, colors and they have a very formal sort of look. So they're perfect for, you know, staging a, staging a home. So books 1.0, get rid of the reference books, the cookbooks, the novels that really are not your favorite novels. Don't open the novel, don't be tempted to open that novel that you really like because you'll, you'll end up going down a hole. And the goal is to always continue to make progress. Every time you go down a hole, you get discouraged and it becomes more daunting. Chipping away, chipping away, piece by piece. Slides and movies are, are really huge. And I think one of the greatest things in the last, oh gosh, probably five years, maybe even longer than that, um, we, we've been afforded a lot of resources that allow us to save those slides and movies and convert them into CDs or get them on a, a thumb drive so they can be saved on a computer. Encourage you, if you have all of those, to do it. Um, sometimes there are even ways you can now take a slide and, and uh, take a photo of it and have it load directly to, to your own computer. Slides can be um, a, an emotional thing in movies, an emotional thing you know, to go through. I think it's really great to take that time with family and use it as an, as a, an opportunity. We're gonna look at the slides really for the, the last time to pull out the ones that really mean the most to all of us and then take those slides and convert those slides and you can recycle all the rest. Boxed photos and framed photos. Um, you know, I have a ton of photo albums and photo albums take up a whole lot more space than a plastic container of photos that have been stacked. I'm not saying get rid of those photos. I'm saying put them in a place that they are a little bit more organized and take up less space. Taking them out of the photo album also gives you an opportunity to say, do I really need it? The days of you know, waiting to get a roll of film developed regardless of what came back, you know, that, that, that picture of some sunset with your thumb in it, because it came back and you paid 20 cents per print, you put it in your photo album. Now is it really you know, the kind of photo that you need to keep? Pull out some of those photos as well to scan them because you can use those as you can use some of your framed photos. We recently did for a client, they had so many framed photos pictures of them as children, their parents, their parents' wedding pictures, all of their children, their grandchildren. And they had grandchildren that, you know, from when they were babies up to their, you know, grandchild's wedding. And they did not want to get rid of all those photos. So they had, we took all of the photos out of all of the frames. We had the, we had all of them scanned. And then we had them put on two separate um, digital frames that rotate in, um, and one was in the family room and the other one was sort of in the kitchen area. So they would never have seen those photos. Some of them that we took out of the boxes or took out of the, um, the, the photo albums, but now they get to enjoy it. And when you're moving to a new community and you're welcoming new friends, it's an amazing uh, way to, to have a conversation when a, one photo pops up that, that conjures up for you good memories and good stories. So I think that's a really great way to use all of your um, uh, all, all your photos and make sure that they're all being seen. This is a time too, when you get sort of close, um, it's, you know, what furniture do you have that's unused, right? Or furniture that's stored away. That furniture may be serving a purpose right now. You may have 10 folding chairs in your basement. You may have um, an additional folding table that you put up for the holidays. That's the kind of stuff that you may not need when you're in the next phase uh, next chapter of your life. So it's time to start dealing with that furniture that you may not, you know, you may not need furniture that's been storing and that you've been using. But it's also a time to question, does that, does that dresser, that small dresser that I have in the bedroom, will that really make a better, um, you know, is that a better option for me to put my television on in my new den? So it gives you an opportunity to sort of think about how can I use some of those things that are unstored? Can I give them sort of a new life in my new life? And then I say go to books 2.0. 
And this is when you go through the novels, you go through like, once more, you take another pass through the cookbooks. Um, did I in the last, you know, you know, a couple of weeks since I looked at this, a couple of months since I looked at it, have I thought about it? Do I feel any differently about it? And then you can think about what do I do with them? Um, going into Riverwoods, you can donate them for community, um, you know, community reading. There are so many great organizations that can use them. I'm not saying get rid of them, keep those that are very important to you, but understand that you're going to need to have a space for them um, wherever you, you know, end up living. And then think about all the, uh, your heirlooms, all your, again, displayed photos. You could have framed photos all over your house, but what are the, you know, the displayed photos? I do want a couple in frames because I want it to feel like home to me. So I am gonna keep these. I'm gonna have, um, you know, this one and this one put in a double frame, thinking about all of that because it limits the amount of stuff that ends up being on a tabletop or a surface. And it's time to inventory your entire furniture sort of, um, collection. You may have held on to your full dining room set because you were entertaining. It now is time to move and you need to right size the, the china cabinet because it may be too big. You don't need all the chairs, you don't need all the leaves, all of that kind of thing. So once you're through all of this and you've gone through, and again, this list is my list. I have kitchen and utensils uh, kitchen utensils and gadgets is something that has some uh, sentimental value to me. And they do because I love to cook and I love every little thing. And if I have to use that cherry picker just once to make one cherry pie a year, the, I want to keep that pitter. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it, but going through those, it's very emotional to sort of give those, to give those up. So this list is, is mine. You can, and we'll provide you with a worksheet. You can make your own list. Start with those things that just don't have any sentimental value and works towards it. When you're ready to move, oops. Oh, here we go. When you're ready to move, you wanna start at the left again, right? Because you did have stuff in your kitchen pantry that you've added to, you've lived for the last year, things that you've added to, pots and pans. You have used that um, lobster pot for the last time this past summer. So you don't need that lobster pot now. You don't, after a second review, you don't need the, um, you don't need the, um, all the pots and pieces, the duplicates uh, tools. You have already gone through your clothing. So all the items that are in bold are items that uh, are, are uh, where we've applied what we call the 80-20 rule. We'll talk about that in a second. And you've already done half the work. There are some items that you probably have nothing more to do. You, you don't have to deal with paint cans and paint thinner. I don't have to deal with books anymore. I've dealt with my slides and my movies. So by the time I'm ready to move, a month, two months before I'm ready, three months, whatever it is, when I'm ready to move, I've already gone through most of it. So then that process is gonna be far less daunting. Let's talk about applying that 80-20 rule. The rule essentially says that 80% of the time we wear 20% or use 20% of what we have. And it's, it's, you'll, you'll see it's kind of true when you try this yourself. So I have a couple of examples, Mary's sweaters. Mary goes to her collection of sweaters. She has 25 of them. She sex, you know, selects 20% of them or six or so. And she, um, and those are gonna be the six that she wears a lot or the six that she likes a lot. She goes and picks out a couple of others that she really likes. And she ends up with, you know, maybe a total of nine, 10, 12 sweaters of a total inventory of 25 that was in her closet. Yeah, it's not 20%, but it is uh, far less than what she had and she's made some room. And I think this approach, it's, it's, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not science, not proven. We just use it as an approach to get started because people always say, I don't even know where to begin. And applying the 80-20 rule really helps. Bill's golf shirts, same thing. Collection of golf shirts from every golf trip we ever went on and every, um, uh, every work trip. Most of them, probably like mine, don't fit um, and still have them. Uh, but going through, picking out the 20%, taking 20% of that population, going and grabbing a few more that you know you, you, you wear because they're comfortable and they fit good and they don't have, um, you know, they don't have any stains on them. Um, or they represent the, the best game of golf Bill's ever, Bill's ever played. 
keep it and you can then right size the remainder. You'll be really surprised when you take the 20% of the entire really count, take 20% out and then add a little bit more to it. You'll be surprised that you'll be left with uh, many items to, to right size. Bill, uh, Mary and Bill's Kitchen dishware is a, a real life example for, uh, for me. Um, we we're helping a, a, a couple get ready to go to uh, a community and they had so much, I think it was called false graph, um, popular in the eighties. They had everything. They had probably, you know, 24 plates, 24 bowls, 24 saucer, uh, saucers and cups, um, serving dishes, serving platters and all that thing, all that. And we said, you know, you love this. It's been in your family. They were given it um, as gifts from the kids over the years back in the eighties. And they, they wanted that. And I said, well, you don't need all of this. We can donate it. Um, or um, it ended up that one of their daughters took it and ended up with, you know, six plates, six saucers, uh, six salad plates. And then we looked at cups and saucers and I said, well, we'll take six of those. Well, we really don't use them. But then I opened the next cabinet. It was stock full of every mug that you can imagine. You know, mug from every trip that they had. They had mugs that, you know, a set of four matching mugs, a set of, you know, that was one pattern, a set of four that was another pattern. So we really then had to downsize uh, and right size the, uh, the mugs. And we did. And we didn't say, we didn't take six mugs. Mugs were a big thing to them because they had a lot of sentimental value to them because they represented a place that they, they were. They ended up keeping most of the mugs that came from Disneyland or Yellowstone Park or wherever than they did the mugs that were sort of a matching set. And I thought that that was, you know, that worked for them. I didn't take out, well, you know, you need to keep these four, you know, these two sets of, of four, these eight mugs are perfect. No, they wanted uh, the mugs that had all of the, uh, the, the, the um, memory attached to them. So in our uh, right sizing guide, and you'll get one, um, access to one, uh, you'll receive a Zoom uh, message email, and it will allow you to, um, to click on it and get a copy of the right sizing, uh, a link to the right sizing guide. And you can also ask uh, us uh, for it uh, by uh, emailing us. And I'll tell you that at the end of our discussion. But this is a, a worksheet that you can start begin. You can start the, the process. Figure out what your timeline is. I want to, in the first two months, I'm going to deal with this, this number of belongings, next two months, et cetera, starting with those things that are low in emotional value or low in sentimental value to you, moving towards those things that may be a little bit more difficult to attack. There are lots of joys in right sizing. It is amazing to look at, open a closet and go, wow, look at that, like all that space. But there also is some, there are some uh, realities and some of them are sobering. Uh, one being that there's not a market for all of the items that you think um, there is. Um, and if there is a market for it, um, the sales price will fall far below what you think the, uh, the, the sales price should be. So managing your expectation around what something is worth and what will sell is really an important part of what we do and a part of our job. Brown furniture, unless these days, you never know, it could change next year. But brown furniture, those bedroom sets that we all have, uh, unless it's mid-century modern, it really doesn't have a lot of value. But what I'll say here is that um, we work a lot with an organization in, in the Boston area called Household Goods. And they, it's an amazing company, started by a couple who are now in their 90s and still work, volunteer um, there with a 900 uh, person and crew. But what they do is they take very usable furniture and they help uh, those less fortunate. Right now, they've been working with a lot of families from Afghanistan to set up their homes. And I always say a brown bedroom set is far better than no bedroom set. And to see people pick up something and take something as they shop around the warehouse is really heartwarming. So give it a new life and it does have a new life and can go on. And the other item, you know, making sure the reality is make sure that family and friends do or don't want it, right? If they don't want something, uh, that's, that can be sort of, you know, it can sort of get you because it's emotional and you think you're, you're attached to that item because it reminds you of them. Um, it's not that that item is something that they are, you know, connected to. Regardless, all items 
towels, sheets, cups, saucers, um, decor, pillows, everything is best given a new purpose. And there are so many things from, you, you know, old sweaters can be turned into mittens to, um, you, know, um, you know, old dressers can be, you know, painted with new hardware and turn into something brand new. So really making sure that you're thinking about the realities and um, making sure that you are really giving items a new life. Now that you have gone through all of this process, how do you manage it? Um, and this is available to you on the right sizing guide in more detail. First are professional move managers and organizers. Um, as a professional move manager, I can't tell you how helpful it is um, to uh, our clients to have an objective third party um, during the right sizing process, because inevitably a couple is not going to agree on the same thing. And it's sometimes it's that third party asking the question, do we really need it? Here's the floor plan of where you're going. Will it really fit? Um, and also if you, if you do use a move manager during the right sizing process, by the time you move, they've become familiar with you. You've become very comfortable with them. They understand what's important to you. They understand where you're going. They understand uh, how you want uh, items to be placed and all of that. Appraisers uh, and auctioneers, uh, appraisers, we, we know the things that don't have a market like a brown uh, bedroom set, but if there's art or coins or stamps, anything that you think is of value, we are going to make sure that you get an appraiser and, or you should make sure that you get it appraised prior to posting it on Etsy or posting it on eBay or Facebook Marketplace. Don't do it if you think it has some value, you know, get it professionally appraised. You can do a, a, a self-managed auction like Max sold. Um, you can use donation centers, donation centers like Savers, Salvation Army, um, Goodwill. There is a national site donationtown.org. If you enter your zip code, it will give you a, um, a list of organizations that will pick things up at your home. Nonprofit organizations, very different than sort of um, those, you know, donation centers. Um, these are organizations that donate items um, that, that really totally benefit someone else. It's really a mission-driven organization like, you know, like Household Goods. There's another one in Northern Mass called Project Home Again. Um, online resources. That is uh, to stop junk mail. If you want to stop junk mail, um, you can go to the uh, FTC government website and they have some um, resources for you to stop junk mail. Uh, it's like being on a do not call list. And then finally, social media is huge and so helpful uh, in uh, dealing with items, whether you're posting them on Facebook marketplace or you have that savvy grandchild or great grandchild post them for you who's probably better at it than any of us are. Um, use those online resources to you know, move some of those items. And I always say if, 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 if at the end you have to use a disposable a disposal company to come and take things out and disposal companies will take things for donation, they will take them for disposal if they have absolutely no value or in some very rare circumstances, they have a consignment shop and they'll put the item on consignment. Um, you're gonna to have to pay to get that removed. If you can get $25 for something that you're probably gonna to have to pay near that to, to get rid of it in weight, then you're probably better off to list that on a place like uh, Facebook Marketplace. All right, you've done a ton of work. I've talked way too much and we wanna get you to maintaining this current state. And we call it maintaining the joy of, of being right-sized. And it's being honest with ourselves about why we have things and why we hold on to stuff. And during that process, you're gonna ask yourself a lot and learn probably a lot about why you held on to certain things. So a couple of tips, uh, especially if you're living in, uh, gonna be living in a new space that's smaller. Um, we are gonna continue to live. We're gonna continue to have monumental life events. We're gonna wanna change our, our, our styles, whatever that is. But if you're gonna buy something, you need to buy something, don't buy new unless it is replacing something that's broken or absolutely needed. Don't, you know, and if you do buy that, you know, air fryer toaster oven combo, make sure that that toaster oven that you have right now goes out. It goes in a box that you keep in the mud room or in the, in the garage, that when it's full, you drop it off at Savers. Start limiting, you know, buying things in bulk and, Again, buy the things in bulk that you regularly use, that you're gonna use the inventory of paper towels. 
don't, you know, unless you are, you're wedded to eating the same cereal for months and months and months, um, and you want to ensure that it's fresh, I always think that it's best to just buy in smaller amounts when it comes to things like that, because you're never, especially in food items, uh, the, the, the quantity in which, you know, that stuff comes is just way too much. But really, so limit buying in bulk to those things that you are, reg that you are going to continually go through. One thing out, one thing in, you go and buy that brand new sweater, an old sweater comes out, you buy that new golf shirt bill and you'll takes out the uh, takes out one of those golf shirts. And then finally, I got this from a client. We moved um, to a community, he had an incredible collection of art. He was an artist himself. And even with art, he would say, you know, my philosophy is touch it once. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, if I touch it once and I don't have an answer as to why I still have it in my house, it gets thrown away. So I always say, touch it once and you will do this. I'm telling you, you go home, open your kitchen cabinet, go to the, one of the kitchen cabinets, go to the top shelf, take one thing out. And I bet you're going to ask yourself, why do, I, why do I have this? When was the last time we even used it? If you're asking yourself that question, it's a good time for you to take that and put it into the, uh, to that donation box. Finally, our right sizing guide is available to you. And also, if you have any questions about right sizing or move management, we're happy to help. You can email us at rightsizing at dovetailcompanies.com. And again, you will get an email from uh, Zoom that gives you a link to that you know, as well. So please, uh, any, anything, uh, as you go through this process, remember, take it in manageable bites. Remember that everyone has stuff and you're really, you know, you're not alone in the process and continue to live. Just know how that you, to manage the items that come into your life as you're doing it. So I thank you very much and, and really welcome uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you, Joe. I was so <laughs> paying attention to you in that last moment. I am so motivated to go home and tackle some big project now, another closet, another you know cabinet like you just described. So we'll really, call you on Monday to make sure. Um, you know what? <laughs> Please do. Accountability is key in all of this. That is a very, very good point. Um, we, uh, Jenny and I, have been answering some questions um, as we've been going through this, particularly the ones that were Riverwood specific, so that we could take this time now and ask you some broader questions. But I, I'm going to give you a chance to, to catch your breath for a moment and answer one uh, thematic question. Um, there, there, there have been a series of questions questions surrounding my large design 56 Christmas collection or my sewing machine or my piano or my tools, of course, my books, um, you know, can Riverwoods use these? Can I bring them for the community to enjoy? And, you know, the, it, the, I guess the answer is going to be, it depends. It depends upon the situation of when you're coming. If the community already has you know, depending upon where we're talking about Exeter, Manchester, or Durham, if they already have six pianos in play, they probably aren't going to say, yes, bring us another piano. Um, if one of those pianos happens to be not repairable, then it might be a welcome thing to come into the community. The same thing with Design 56. Um, we, we don't have the capacity to store your items for you. Um, and there may not be a need to have that particular design element for our holiday decorations. So what we would encourage you to do is to have a conversation with your sales counselor. Um, likewise, I answered one of the questions um, uh, you know, by typing a response on books. Uh, some communities may be accepting books, others maybe not. That's a library committee decision, a resident committee that runs the library. So reach out to the community that you are moving to to have those conversations about those things. The question on tools, Quite honestly, um, you know, I would use the wood shop example because we have all of our communities have really well equipped wood shops. There are times when residents are bringing new equipment into those wood shops, like the piano scenario I just um, described. Um, so whether or not there are shared tools, I expect there are residents who share that resource with each other, but that is something I would say, have a conversation with your sales counselor and let them connect you with a resident who may share that same you know, affinity. Um, so that, that's to address all of those questions. Now I, I have one for you specifically, Joe. 
Um, how does one get rid of expensive, fine paintings or pieces of art? Tastes vary so much, galleries, consignment, donation. Um, the first thing is to get it appraised, right? And then you'll find out whether or not there's a market for it. If you can get it appraised, then generally an appraiser is gonna know whether or not there's a gallery that will accept it. If the appraiser has a specific, there are some appraisers who end up buying it. Um, there are some appraisers who will take it for their own, um, you know, their own auctions. I can't stress enough the importance of having it professionally valued. Um, and, and once you have it professionally valued and you know what it is, you have a story. And the more you have, the more information you have on it, the better uh, it is, the chances of, of, of gaining more information. Then you have the ability um, to shop it to respective galleries. The internet for everything during the right sizing process is our absolute best friend. I think that once you once you 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 have a, a painting by a certain artist from, you know, um, the Berkshires, for example, you, know, you can then you can Google and find out where is that artist and what do they have. We had a client who did who had a lot of quilts, decorative quilts that were hanging in his house, mm -hmm. and we found the uh, quilter uh, that made them, and she ended up purchasing them back. So it's really, it's, you have to do your, you, you have to do your research and, and I would never accept, uh, never sort of just post it and say best offer. I would always make sure, you always need to make sure that you have uh, an understanding of what the value is and can back that up. I just, I do want to add about the, um, the pianos. Um, that's a common um, challenge, um, but we've had success with churches, um, piano schools. We've called piano schools and asked if there are students who don't have pianos. Sometimes the schools themselves will take them. YMCA, after school programs, rec centers, they really will end up taking them. And all it, it, it is for them is, is the opportunity to, um, they, they, they pay for, you know, the transport. We use a, a piano mover to do that. Um, and then the tools, huge um, uh, uh, contributor to vocational schools. Um, after school programs um, and to any of you, your, uh, my brother-in-law had one of those red craftsman tools we donated to the uh, vocational school um, and they could use that in their um, automotive classes. So there are lots of places for them where they're really welcome if you can't get them into the community. That's really great. Thank you, Joe. That's a really good point. Um, there were two questions around the getting rid of documents and the question of five versus seven years and IRS recommendations, um, obviously tied to the types of tax returns, you know, sole proprietor. Yep. So uh, the question was, um, you know, you suggested seven years, why? And somebody else asking if they needed to keep them longer for uh, capital gains purchases, um, purposes. Um, Seven years, seven years is the general IRS guideline for, you know, majority of documents. We always say um, to our clients that you need to check with your CPA, your tax advisor, as mm -hmm. to what it is you need to keep. There are lots of things that are probably older than seven years that are available to you online, you know, from, from um, whether you're in Fidelity or Putnam or Vanguard, wherever you have that stuff saved historically in your document center. So, you know, I would really, number one, know what your, you know, your asset manager has uh, for, you know, retention of uh, electronic records. And also for, for those that aren't electronic, make sure that your advisor, uh, um, you check with your advisor to ensure that you're saving only what you need. <clears throat> okay. and, and if you don't, if you don't, and those that you don't need, there are lots of services to, to deal with um, shredding them. If you don't want to sit over your shredder, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Kate comments that we skipped over memorabilia and collections. Anything to say about that? Um, memorabilia and collections are very personal. Um, Hummels, we see that, you know, collection of Hummels is, it's devastating for people who have collected Hummels in Yadro and Balik, China. Um, there's not a market for any of those things. And, Again, the internet is a really great resource. Um, and the, what's recorded on the bottom, um, there are some Hummels, for example, that are worth something if they have a certain stamp. So it's really researching all of those things 
And then sometimes people reuse those, you know, artistic crafty people will take those and turn them into something, something else. Memorabilia, I think, you know, I, I think of things like um, trophies from, from, from high school. Um, and you don't want to throw them away. You want recognition. You want to remember those. So you can do things like take photos of every one of those, put them in your digital photo frame that's going to, you know, rotate. Um, one thing that I did for my sister for her 50th birthday, she was an athlete and, and she got all the athletic genes, uh, an athlete in high school, is I took the brass plates off of every one of her um, um, okay. trophies and I mounted it on a board and had it framed. And that was a way for her to have all of those. And I, we donated the bodies of the, the oh, trophies yeah. and, and they took them. So it's really, you know, it, again, asking friends or family if they're interested in any of those, do any of these give, you know, evoke a memory for you uh, and you want that you want, search whether or not there is a market. And again, donate it because what you, you know, some people may still be collectors. There are still collectors of Hummels regardless of, whether they have a value. So if you donate them, you can certainly get a, you know, a small tax write off, but someone else is, is able to enjoy them. Um, so this is, this is a, sounds more, it sounds like a plea for like getting rid of something. Uh, Carol comments that she has a silver tea service uh, or silver tea service candlesticks that she would like someone to come in and get rid of them with a, without her having to, to, to deal with it any longer. So I guess the question is, you know, who are those services that can come in and, you know, purge things that you just want removed from your home? Um, you can, if it's something specific like silver, you want to make sure that it's, um, you know, sterling as opposed to silver plate. Um, you can either search for someone on the internet you can go to local or refer to your local antique stores, or you know you you can you know a local um, I don't know where you are, but a, a move manager or professional organizer is they're going to have um, a lot of those resources and come in literally can come in and take care of it. If it was something that was you know if it was a sterling set um, or sterling candlesticks, we would absolutely make sure that that was all um, appraised prior to doing you know absolutely anything with it. So there's a good market for silver now, actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I do want to point out that we are, we have now gone past two o'clock. Our commitment was to keep this to an hour, but the questions are still coming in. Um, Joe has agreed to continue on. So um, we'll continue on and try to get through all the questions that we have as of now. Um, if you have to log off, we thank you for joining us, but we will continue on through these questions. Um, I, I'm gonna read this statement to you, Joe. I'm sure you'll have an opinion on this. Um, does this make sense? I'm thinking of putting stuff that I don't know whether I can use at Riverwoods in a storage unit. After I've moved in, I can go th through the storage unit and decide whether or not I'll need the stuff. For example, paintings and decor, China collection, certain furniture, cooking appliances, bicycle gear, camping gear, et cetera. What's your thought on that? Well, first of all, you, you don't wanna, you, you don't want to pay a mover to move it or a move manager to pack it for one thing. Um, you will put it there with the best of intentions. You are going to enjoy your life in a very different way. You're not going to want to go to that storage center and store it, the storage unit and, and sort it out. I really think that you need to, if you don't, if you're not going to display it or use it in your new space, then don't store it. Because I, number one, I don't want you to pay to have it moved. And then if you have to get rid of it, you're gonna have to then pay, you, you move it, you decide that you don't want it, you have to then pay someone or find someone to then get rid of it for you. So I, I highly suggest that you take care of it before you move so that you can enjoy your, your new life at Riverwoods. I, I would echo that, Joe. And I would also share that our move-in coordinators at each community can help you with planning, as will Dovetail, help you with planning what will fit into your new space so you can make those uh, decisions without the expenses that Joe was just outlining. Um, Joe, if books are underlined, should they just be tossed or will they still be donatable? Donatable. Okay, thank you. Donatable. They, they, they still have they still have their information. Great. Um, can you please repeat the name of the organization in Boston that takes used furniture? I think that was Household Goods. Household Goods in Acton, I believe. Okay. 
And there's also a place in Andover, if someone's close, it's called Project Home Again. And then Mission of Deeds, which is in Reading, Massachusetts. Thank you. Uh, do you know the names of art dealers? Could you provide a few? Are there any any specific names in the right sizing guide, Joe? No, or we don't. No, we, we don't provide those because it's it, it really the list is exhaustive depending on you know what the item is. Again, if you're going to tackle this you know on your own, I again please get everything appraised. You're thinking the right way. You can you can find some um, by googling those, and you can do both auction houses or art appraisers. Okay. Um, there are a couple of questions. I'm, I want to try to uh, put them all together here. Um, in terms of dovetail, it, how does your company charge for services performed, hourly rate, flat rate? Um, somebody from upstate New York is, is considering Riverwoods. They'd like to know if dovetail, dovetail can help them. Um, and we'd like to thank you for the wonderful overview. So a little bit about um, how dovetail so works with a client. So we work with clients um, that are going from, you know, moving within, you know, Durham, New Hampshire to Durham, New Hampshire, at, you know, Riverwoods. We work with clients who are coming out of state, um, whether it be in the New England area or we've recently moved someone um, from Arizona, uh, Virginia, Ohio. Um, and we do have good partnerships with um, an, uh, Van Lines, a company that's uh, a Boston based company that's a United Van Lines uh, affiliate. And they really help and we work with us in making sure that we are um, receiving everything that should be received. We've worked on the floor plan to make sure that everything you're, set, you're, you're, you're sending is, is, is going to fit into the apartment. So th th that is the, sort of the answer to we'll work with anyone. If we need to find a move manager, we are members of the North, uh, the National Association of Senior and Specialty Move Managers. So we reach out to our colleagues and we partner with them to provide our out-of-state uh, residents with a resource locally that we partner with. Uh, and then, you know, we'll do same, the same thing that we do. We offer all of our services are uh, $95 an hour, and that's $95 an hour per person. Um, and that, in, that includes um, sorting and organizing, right-sizing, working with you, going through items, going through um, your entire, you know, your, 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 all of your clothing. If you say, you know something, I don't want to deal item by item, please just deal with my basement. We'll go deal with your basement. We also work on um, understanding, you know, where it is that you're going, what's your new space, um, measuring the, getting the uh, Riverwoods floor plan, confirming all the measurements, developing a to scale floor plan um, for you that we can then, once we've measured all of the furniture, we place that furniture on the plan. That is incredibly powerful because it allows you to get excited about your space. You know, you can do that very early on, gets excited about the space, but it also said, it also gives you a visual as to, oh, I can't take that. I'm not going to have space for it, or I'm going to have to swap it out with something else. So we work um, with, you know, floor planning. Again, the floor plan is, it's about a couple of hours um, a time. And, and that again is billed at, at $95 an hour. And then it's the packing and the unpacking. And we pack, um, we pack, we take full responsibility for every item that we do pack and every item that we unpack. Um, and then our goal is by hopefully 2.30 in the afternoon of move-in day, everything is set, uh, including your bed is made. And that's really, a <laughs> that bed is really important to us because we find it's a really intimate place and it's one of the last things that we do. Um, so you are fully settled. We've gotten rid of all the boxes. Um, and then we've worked with cable, the cable company to make sure that your cable is properly installed. We've worked with um, the mover to make sure that we've, we, we'll get you the estimates. We don't mark up the cost of the mover. We just coordinate uh, uh, with you movers that uh, are, are approved by us and by Riverwoods. Um, and then finally, we do provide what we call settling in services. And that is, you know, sometimes you have a lot of art or you put things in the, the, the um, the, the primary bedroom closet that you think, you know, that's how you wanted it set up. After you live with it for a couple of days, you say, oh, I need some help. Can you come help me? We didn't hang all the art. Let's come help me hang the art. Can we come and sort of re, uh, reorganize my, you know, my closet? Cause I've lived with it for a couple of days and it doesn't work or it doesn't really serve me so well. So we will do, you know, all of those, all of those things, both locally and uh, out of state. Thank you. 
Um, a couple of questions about disposing of fine china, Joe, and any recommendations you have for that? Again, I would donate, I would, first of all, I would research if it's uh, worth anything. Um, and there are, there are online uh, resources that will purchase china. Um, you, can um, you can check out replacements.com and that's where you can both purchase odd pieces of china as well as sell. So what they ask you to do is you can fill out a form um, telling, telling them what it is uh, and how many of them, you, um, how many pieces that you have, and they'll come back and tell you whether or not they will buy any of it. Um, again, the, 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 the price is probably far less, the, far less than you expect. And sometimes the cost to ship it, you know, it, it ends up being a wash. So that's, that's one resource. Again, um, China is used a lot in um, crafts. Um, so a Goodwill, a Savers, a Salvation Army, they will take, you know, China, and there are still people who love and collect that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, there, there's a, certainly a market for it. I would never, I would never throw it away. Good points. Um, again, I want to revisit when I, there's a couple of comments about we skipped over the sewing machine question. Sewing oh, machine, we didn't skip it. I, I just got to put it back into that. Sewing machines and Design 56 and piano and tools and books. All of those things, what we're recommending is you reach out to your sales counselor, because depending upon, you know, the community that you're moving into and the status of their creativity space, they may or may not uh, welcome another machine. Uh, there may be three machines already there that you can use and don't need to bring your own. So please um, have that conversation with your sales counselor. And, and to that point, I would also say there are a lot of, we're still getting questions, Joe. Um, there are a lot of questions coming in that we will reach out to you if, you, if we have your name um, and try to provide an answer to you, as well as when the um, e-blast will come out to you on Saturday, that will have a recording of this presentation. We'll include the link to the right sizing guide and all of Joe's contact information. I know Joe, as well as uh, myself and my colleagues would welcome furthering the conversation with you about these specific questions. Um, we're coming up on 2.15. I will try to answer, get a couple more in front of you. There's a lot of thank yous as well. I echo that. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and let's see, people are sharing other suggestions too, which is great. Um, uh, how does one get a reasonable cost appraisal? When I have contacted them in the past, I've been told an appraisal can be 700, several hundred dollars per piece. Thus, I've really gotten things appraised, ideas. Oh, I, I, I guess it depends on what you're getting appraised. There are so many. I, th I think auction houses are probably a better, well, well, not better. I think there are auction houses who will, um, they'll come and give an appraisal because they will put it, you know, in one of their, you know, one of their auctions and not going to charge you for it. They're certainly going to take a piece of the proceeds. But appraisers should not be, um, they, they, they should not be charging an exorbitant amount of money. I mean, if, you think about the, if they're coming to appraise something, it's not going to take them an hour. They may charge $150. And if it's a, a piece that's worth thousands, that's absolutely you know worth it. Mm -hmm. um, but we also like to get people connected with buyers or so appraisers who are buyers so that you know they can give it, you know, appraise it, but also will will buy it. Um, but I, I do think that there can be a return on that you know investment to have it done by the appraiser. Um, because if you know its value and you have a, um, a recorded or documented value of what that piece is, you can then use that as a, um, a tool in selling it. Um, so once you have it appraised, you have more detail on it, the appraiser is going to share that information. You can then post that or look for sellers or buyers who are looking for that specifically. So sometimes there is a return on that investment and it is worth doing that. I've never seen an appraiser um, charge as, as high as seven hundred dollars, unless it's a several full, hundred. Sorry, not seven hundred. Several hundred. Oh, several yeah. hundred. Yeah, unless it's a huge collection of, of of art and you know sculpture in China and all that kind of stuff, it's not been um, it's not been you know tremendous. But again, if it ends up being something that's of value, you're going to recoup that cost because you're going to have every all the information you need to to appropriately sell it and give the, the buyer confidence that it is what it is. Very well. 
Well, thank you. It is now uh, 2.16, so I appreciate you spending the extra time with us, Joe, as well as our participants who are still um, with us. Um, just want to highlight our next event, um, which is going to be an economic outlook for New Hampshire and beyond on um, Thursday, March 10th, two weeks from today at one o'clock. You can register by going to riverwoodsgroup.org slash events. Um, and uh, again, I wanna thank everyone for being with us today. Um, on the next slide, there is each of our websites. You can reach out to us at these three locations. Call your sales counselor. We will be happy to further discuss these topics with you if we don't have the, uh, the answer at our fingertips, we will consult and, and lead you in um, the right direction. So again, thank you, Joe. It was a pleasure, really oh. enjoyed. And you motivated me again. Oh, good. I appreciate that personally. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks everybody.